street level hangout uh, is also on Tuesday afternoon at 5 p.m., both again on Zoom. We're now going to turn to our Bible reading, and uh, Ali and Jenna are going to bring us the reading, and then Graham will give us the talk. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The second reading today is taken from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Zacchaeus the tax collector. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody, and uh, let me extend my welcome to the welcome that Andrew gave earlier on today. My name is Graham Hunter. I'm the vicar of the church, and uh, I'm delighted to be worshipping with you all this morning, wherever you may be, whether here in Hoxton, whether spread further afield in London, the UK, or anywhere else in the world you might be watching from. It's really wonderful to worship together online. It would be even better if we could be in the building, uh, lifting our hearts up to the Lord, singing out with um, all of our heart, uh, but it's also wonderful to be able to sing in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, in our kitchens, wherever we may be, and to worship and to have fellowship together. I'm going to continue a new sermon series that we began last week, uh, and I've entitled this sermon series, All Things New, and I've shamelessly stolen that title from a book, uh, All Things New, by Pete Hughes. Pete is the uh, vicar and uh, pastor of a church up in King's Cross, a church called KXC, and he's written this book uh, really about the great story of Christianity, the great story of creation, decreation or fall, and recreation and renewal. And I want to commend this book to you. Um, I'm sure that Caroline will post the link once again in the chat. It's only seven or eight pounds or so. You can order it online. And it would be a really worthwhile thing to be reading, to refresh yourself and remind yourself about uh, what it means to us, what the great story of our faith. Um, one of the strap lines of the book, and it's on the back uh, cover as well, is the story you live in is the story you live out. In other words, our worldview, what we believe about reality, will affect the way we live. And for Christians, for us, that means it's really important to be always going back and rehearsing and refreshing and reminding ourselves of the great story of God's saving work so that we can then think about the implications for how we live. We thought last week about baptism, and, and this week I want to carry on. It's in a way a sort of two-parter, thinking about baptism and new beginnings, and now thinking a bit about our identity. But let's pray as we begin. Father, it's our prayer today 
that you would graciously pour out your Holy Spirit on us. That in this time together, we would be changed. That we would be transformed. That we would be reminded once again of who we are in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you help us to resist the distractions that may come uh, during this next half hour or so. Help us to resist the scrolling, the changing tabs, the flicking channels, and give us confidence that you will speak to us in this time. May I hear your voice, and may the words that I have prepared be used by your spirit to bring life and light to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. We spoke last week about baptism, and we were using the story of the baptism of Jesus to think about uh, what it means to be in Christ, to belong to Christ, to be adopted into God's family. We love a newborn baby, don't we? If friends of yours have a newborn baby and they post photos on Facebook or Instagram or wherever, we get delighted. We hit that heart uh, button with uh, all that we can, all our energy. We like to comment, we like to share. I remember the delight and the joy when our own children were born and um, having sought prior permission and I knew it would be granted, my parents had said, phone us at any time of the day or night when the baby is born because we are delighted to hear the good news of new birth. We love a newborn baby. But the interesting thing about newborn babies is they're pretty useless. They're pretty helpless. They haven't done anything. They haven't achieved anything. Um, They don't really do anything to warrant our love. They just are. They just exist. They've just been created through this act of marital love. And uh, there they are. The interesting thing about Jesus and his baptism is that he hasn't yet performed any miracles. He's not begun his public ministry. He's not begun teaching. He's not delivered the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't have a reputation as a great teacher, a healer, an exorcist, a performer of miracles. My goodness, he's not even resisted any temptations yet. He's not proved himself. And yet... At the baptism of Jesus, a voice comes from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. What's that about? He's not done anything. How did he earn this love? What did he do to deserve it? Well, of course, the answer is nothing. He, He didn't and he doesn't. God simply declares his love. Now Jesus, immediately after his baptism, is going to be driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And at that point, he's going to be tempted by the devil, by Satan, by the evil one, to question his identity. In Jesus' baptism, he's been, his, his fundamental identity, the truth about who he is, has been declared over him. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. That's what God says to Jesus. That's his identity. And, and yet... Immediately after, in the wilderness, when he's hungry and he's weak, when he's tired, when he's spent 40 days in lockdown, I mean sort of, uh, he is going to be tested by the enemy and the fundamental test that Jesus will face is a test of his identity. What does the devil say three times? If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. If, if, Jesus knows he's the son of God. The voice from heaven came and spoke over him at his baptism. And yet, it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to lose that identity which is given us. And today we're going to follow on from the story of the baptism of Jesus and thinking about what it means for us to be baptized and to belong in Christ, to think a little bit more about our own identity One of the fundamental things that we're going to have to get our head around is what you could call the now and the not yetness of our identity. I know that yetness is not a word, but I think maybe it should be. Uh, Or as one uh, author put it, the being and the becoming of Christian life. That is to say, we are Christians, we are children of God, and we are becoming Christians. We're becoming children of God. We, we are now the adopted, um, glorious, wonderful, beloved children of God. 
And, and yet there's something which is still not yet. There's something which is still changing in us. A, a, an identity which is being recovered and, and discovered and renewed. Last week I told a story about two sculptures as an illustration. I talked about the story of um, Michelangelo's Pieta, which was uh, smashed into a thousand pieces, masterpiece, shattered, uh, and, and then painstakingly and lovingly restored. And I use that as an analogy for how our own glorious, beautiful lives, um, perfect in Christ as it were, are shattered and broken by sin, uh, but are being painstakingly restored by the work of the Spirit in us. And I told another story about Michelangelo's David and held up to be one of the most, master, most masterful pieces of sculpture in human history. But reminding us that it began as a hunk of ugly, unhewn marble and the beauty had to be carefully carved out. It's a story of a finished masterpiece, broken and yet being restored, but also a hunk of unformed rock yet to have beauty formed from it. The now and the not yetness, the being and the becoming. We have an identity given to us and our identity is also being formed or you might say transformed as we become more like Christ. We are image bearers, children of God, and we're not yet mature. We're not yet completed. We're not yet finished. We are a work in progress. St. Paul in Colossians 1.27 uh, says that his aim is to present to God everyone finished in Christ, complete. The Greek word he uses there is teleon. It means finished, completed. Uh, in some translation says mature in Christ. But there's a sense in which for all that St. Paul and the Bible wants to affirm our identity as children of God, it's still saying there's still something to change, to, to, de to develop, to mature. Let's go back to that newborn baby. A newborn baby, when, the, when we share the picture on Instagram or Facebook and we, we tap on the heart icon and we, we get so excited, it's perfect, the newborn, it's a perfect newborn baby. But if it stayed that way, week in, week out, something would have gone badly wrong. Newborn babies are made to grow. They are designed to grow into full human life, into adulthood, into maturity. And today I want to think a little about the way in which our identity is given to us, but also the way in which it is formed in us. So identity given, first of all, spend a few minutes on this. There's a question that we have to explore about where our identity comes from. And, and even those words, identity given to us, may seem a little bit peculiar to you because all of us live in a particular culture, a particular society, at a particular point in history. We live in the, the sort of late modern Western society where our entire worldview, our entire way of thinking is extraordinarily shaped and influenced by um, the, the development of thought through the Enlightenment and in the modern period and, and particularly uh, in the last hundred or so years through kind of um, capitalism, consumerism and more recently globalization. But that's not the only way of thinking about identity. I want to kind of set up for us perhaps um, two ideas. Um, two ways in which our identity may be given to us. There, are, there, there is, in non-Western cultures and in ancient cultures, a sense in which identity is assigned to you through family, through your community, through your village, your society. And this is to say that your identity is found in your duties and in your roles that are assigned in family and community. To be the son of a father would mean to join in with the family business, to one day take it over, to inherit, to have responsibilities for the household. And, and in non-Western and in ancient cultures, in the sense in which your identity is given to you by the role and the duty you perform within your, your family and your community, honour and self-worth come from the extent to which we conform to the social codes and roles. Now that's really strange to us because we don't like the idea of thinking that we might just be simply given a role and a set of duties to perform simply by virtue of where we're born or the family into which we're born. We like to think about freedom and mobility and self-determination. 
And that's because we live in a worldview that has been shaped by Western modernism. We think that our identity is created by our own will or decision. One sociologist who writes about uh, how we think of ourselves, how we think about our identity, is called Robert Bella. And he, and he writes about what he calls expressive individualism. That is the sense that we, we determine our identity as individuals uh, and we believe that we have a right to express our individuality. He says this, each person, under this view of expressive individualism, individualism each person has a unique core feeling and intuition that must unfold and be expressed if individual identity is to be realized. In other words, if anybody, if anybody tells you what your role or your duty or your identity or your purpose is, then they're actually limiting your freedom. They're stifling your individualism. This worldview is expressed in popular culture. As one uh, famous text puts it, climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. Now, you probably recognize those are the words of the song from uh, The Sound of Music. And I know I'm going to be in trouble with my wife later on for saying anything critical about the sound of music, but what's the fundamental worldview and the fundam fundamental message of that song? It's this, leave the convent, leave the community, leave your vows, go out and figure out who you are and who you want to be. Isn't that extraordinary? That's the message of our age. In the name of freedom, you are told, you're going to have to decide who you want to be. You're not to let anybody tell you who you are. You decide and then you achieve it. And your dignity and your self-worth, your sense of honor and, and self-esteem will be derived uh, solely on how successfully you achieve the identity you have determined for yourself. So there's two, in a way, polar opposites of how identity might be uh, formed within us. It's, it's either given to us through families and roles and duties to community, or it's something that's determined by us. What does the Bible say in the beginning of John's Gospel? It says um, about, about uh, the Word. It says that the Word was born uh, not of a human decision or a father's will, but born of God. And as it were, uh, that polarizes for us as well, those two identities. You, you, can, you can find your identity, your being in human decision, self-determination, uh, or the Father's will, as it were, the, the duties imposed on you by community. And, and both of them can be stifling, you see, but in different ways. Because when your identity is given you purely because of your family and the roles and the duties that you have to conform to, it can be stifling. And it can be used in exploitative and oppressive ways. We know that. You know that. Some of you belong to families where you know that uh, the duties that are heaped upon you by parents or grandparents or aunties or whoever it might be, or, uh, they, can be they can be used exploitatively and oppressively. They can be used in a way that's unjust. But equally, if you're given, as it were, the so-called freedom to self-determine, you fi find yourself in a, in a cage of your own making. You've set out your course for who you want to be, what your identity is going to assert in the world, and then it's dependent only on you. You're the only one who can make that happen. Tim Keller has a lovely phrase about uh, what the Christian gospel says about our identity. He says, in Christianity, we discover that our identity is received, not achieved. Received, not achieved achieved. We live in a culture which is obsessed with our own achievements. More about that later. But he says you can receive an identity. Back to Jesus and his baptism. Before he's done anything, you are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. We see another little insight into this gospel story about our identity in John chapter 10. So commonly in the Bible, we're described as sheep. And Jesus talks about us as sheep in John chapter 10, describes himself as the good shepherd and says that we are his sheep. And what's the thing about sheep? Sheep are 
utterly helpless. They are hopelessly unself-sufficient. They can't really do anything for themselves. They are totally dependent. And yet that's the term that Jesus uses. That's the animal to which we are likened, utterly dependent. And we are named by Jesus. He says the good shepherd knows the sheep by name. They don't have to earn an identity or determine an identity. They're just given a name by Jesus. When we are in Christ, that's verse 17 in uh, the first reading we had from 2 Corinthians 5, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. If anyone is in Christ, a work of new creation occurs. And, And that phrase is drawing upon, St. Paul is drawing upon his characteristic language about baptism. He says time and time again in his letters that when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ. We become en Christos is the Greek phrase, in Christ, knit into him. And he says our old self, our old life, our old identity is gone. The old is gone and the new has begun. And this changes the way that we think about our identity and the identity of of others, one another. And that's why in verse 16, just before, he says, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. We don't measure people up by the story that the world has to say about people. We have a new story about people's identity and people's worth. We know that every human person is made in the image of God that those words spoken over us at our baptism can be spoken over every living person, that God looks upon all of humanity as the sphere of his saving work and longs to draw everybody into his arms of love in which he can say, you are my daughter, my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased, not because we achieved it, not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, but simply because that is the nature and character and heart of God as our father. The defining story about your identity the defining story of your neighbor's identity, your, your husband's identity, your children's identity, your work colleague's identity, the fundamental story is not the same as what the world would say. The world around us might say you are your achievements or you are your preferences or even you are your worst behaviors. You commit a crime, you're a criminal. You struggle with an addiction to pornography, you're an addict. You climb the career, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the career ladder of success and get to partner, MD, chief executive, you're successful. But those are the kind of messages in the world around us. You, you smash your GCSEs, your A-levels, get into a top university, then you're an achiever, you're worthwhile. The world around us might say all of those things. It might say, you know, this is, this is my attraction. I'm attracted to people of the same sex and therefore you're gay. There's all kinds of things that the world might say around our tastes, around our preferences that get then constrained into a fundamental identity which is supposed to determine who you are. We can look at class and culture, aspirations, wealth, success. We could look at race and ethnicity, education, and take upon ourselves all kinds of stories about our identity, which we think are then fundamental and defining. And the gospel says no. The gospel says you are created in the image of God. You are destined to be adopted into his family, to become a child of God. That you have a a value and a worth that is infinite, beyond measure, and that is given you irrespective of your preferences, your achievements, or even your worst behaviors. Paul reminds us immediately in this passage in 2 Corinthians 5 that it's the ministry of reconciliation that is fundamental to this work of new creation in our life in Christ. That our sins are forgiven. Our fundamental fallenness, brokenness, rebelliousness against God and his kingdom is forgiven, wiped clean, and that it's exchanged for the righteousness of Christ. Look at verses 19 
and 21 in 2 Corinthians 5. Receiving this new identity involves learning, again, the story of humanity, created, fallen, in exile, but redeemed and restored, made new, and then learning to apply this story in our own lives and to recognize the difference between the story of our identity that the world invites us to write for ourselves and the story of our identity given by God. I fundamentally believe that when we can receive that eternal truth about our identity as children of God, we experience a freedom and a joy and a hope like nothing the world can offer. That's why I became a Christian at the age of 14. That's why I'm still a Christian at the age of 42. It's a better story. And it transforms our lives. And I must move on and speed up a little bit. But I want to just, uh, so we talked about where our identity comes from. Our identity is given us in God. And I want to talk about how our identity is formed. But by way of getting there, I want to talk just briefly about cognitive behavioral therapy. I read an interesting thing about it this week. And in particular about the work of a man named Albert Ellis. And he had a scheme which resembles a pyramid with layers. And this was his way of trying to explain why we behave the way we behave and why we think the way we think. And, and he called it his sort of ABC. He said that all of us experience activating events. Things happen to us uh, in childhood, in adulthood, through our lives. Things happen. Events happen. And that, if you like, that's the base layer of the pyramid. And upon that, we form beliefs about who we are and, who the, and what the world is around us. We form beliefs. And on top of those beliefs, so activating events, beliefs, upon those, we have consequent behaviors. That's the A, the B, and the C. Activating events, beliefs, consequent behaviors. We, we behave and we live in response to the beliefs we have about the world. Now, that can play out in all manner of ways. But, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of child who is raised in a single-parent family may feel from that activating event that they've never had a father who loved them. If the father leaves, the mother, the relationship breaks down, the child may believe that they have no father who loves them. And that gives them those beliefs, right? And then they behave as somebody who is seeking approval or or love or affection in all manner of ways. There's a relationship between the stories we believe and how we behave. And of course, false beliefs can give rise to unhealthy behaviors. We might believe the story of the world that we live in a competitive society, a competitive race, that it's survival of the fittest. We might believe that there's a limited pool of goods and, and that we just have to fight for our own slice of the pie. That might give rise to competitive behaviors. But what does this mean for Christians? Well, this is uh, what uh, Pete Hughes writes in his book, All Things New. He says, you know, our Christian worldview can, can, can deconstruct our irrational beliefs. But actually, there has to be an activating event to a new story as well. He says, far beyond that, God takes on human flesh in the person of Jesus and through his life, death, and resurrection provides a new activating event. And as we build on this foundation, new beliefs emerge that we are loved, that we have been chosen, forgiven, adopted into a family, called out with a purpose to live for and a hope to live with. And the new beliefs begin to transform every part of our lives, bringing healing and liberation to us and through us. I think that's wonderful. And I'll, I'll post that quote uh, on our social media channels a little later today so you can go back to it. But here's the point. There's a new activating event in the history of the world that becomes effective in our lives. The death and the resurrection of Jesus have secured our reconciliation to God. So we have a new belief about our identity as adopted children of God. And now new lives, new behaviors can begin. I want to talk, uh, and I'm going to speed a little through this and um, talk very briefly about how our identity is formed or indeed how it's transformed. So as we've seen, our identity is given us, but it's also formed by the beliefs that we have about the world. And, and in the process of conversion, as it were, we're switching from one set of beliefs and stories about the world uh, and our identity to another set of stories and beliefs. 
we undergo transformation. Now, we can see this transformation happening in the life of Zacchaeus when he encounters Jesus in Luke 19. And I want to just, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. I want to start with the very end of the story. In verse 10, Jesus says that he came to seek and save the lost. That's Jesus' purpose. He came to seek and save the lost. Well, what does lost mean in that sentence? And I think there's a risk for us when we read the Bible, when we read that uh, gospel story, that we, we fall into a slightly Victorian notion of lost morality, as though Jesus is primarily seeking those who have succumbed to licentious behaviors, drunkards, fornicators, sinners, those who have lost the moral behaviors of the narrow way. And of course, that can lead us dangerously into judgmentalism and make us like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. But I think instead that we can read that passage, that scripture, And think about Jesus talking about saving those who have lost their identity. They've lost the story about who they are. Those who have never known or who have forgotten that they are beloved sons and daughters of the living God. Jesus is seeking those who have lost the story of their fundamental vocation to be God's image bearers. And in the story of Zacchaeus, things change. Jesus addresses Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is an outcast in his society. He's Jewish, but he's working for the Romans, so he's working for the occupying oppressive force, so he's hated by his community. If uh, any identity is given him in his Jewishness, it should be to resist the oppressor, to resist uh, the enslaver, to seek God earnestly and to pray for liberation. And in a culture in which that identity and expectation is given to him, he has shirked it. He's not fulfilling it, so he has no honor, no self-worth. He's an outcast, a social pariah, because he's joining in with um, the Romans, collecting taxes on their behalf, skimming off the top to make some money for himself. But Jesus encounters him, and Jesus, this great rabbi, uh, crowds gathering to him, says, I want to spend time with you. The one nobody else will eat with, I want to come to your house. As an event which is transformative. Suddenly Zacchaeus is beginning to develop new beliefs about his self-worth, about who he is. And then his behaviours change. I'm just rushing through this, but you can see what's going on, can't you? He had an old story, he has a new story. Transformation, our transformation begins with questions about the nature of the world and about the story in which we live. It begins with non-conformity to the stories of the world. The Greek word for transformation is metamorphosis, metamorphose. And it's used on three occasions in the New Testament is used three times to talk about a transformation of our body, a transformation of our minds, and a transformation of our spirit or our hearts. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. There it is, non-conformity. So the heart of the identity of a Christian disciple, be a non-conformist. But it's ridiculous, here am I, an Anglican vicar telling you all to become non-conformists. But there we are, Uh, non-conformity is at the heart of the gospel. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, you've got to have a new way of learning, a new way of thinking, a new story, a new set of beliefs about the world. It's your head, transformed heads. Elsewhere, in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, Paul says this about the transformation of our heart or our spirit. He says, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with the increasing glory, which is the Lord, who is the spirit. We're being transformed into his likeness. We're undergoing a spiritual transformation. Our hearts are being transformed. Prophet Jeremiah said, when God will give his people a new heart and put his spirit within us the things that we love will be transformed in the story of the world we're taught to love ourselves our tastes our lusts our preferences our consumption we're taught to satisfy our own desires in we're taught fundamentally to love ourselves and to see our own good and our own 
self-expression. And what does Jesus say? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. It sits at odds with the message of the world but we, we have transformed hearts. Paul says that we're being transformed. And then finally, Paul uses the word metamorphose to talk about the transformation of our bodies, our, our hands as it were. Philippians 3.21, by the power that enables God to bring everything under his control, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. New bodies, new hands, new living, new behaviors, new ways of acting and being in the world, a new outward manifestation of his story. So our identity is given to us in our adoption into God's family by baptism into Jesus. You are my daughter, my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. You've not done anything yet. You don't deserve it. You've not earned it. You're loved. But we're also being transformed. Our identity is being transformed. Away, as it were, from conformity to the pattern of this world and instead to be transformed into his likeness, into the likeness of God in Jesus. I've been watching lots of uh, fantasy movies months, the Marvel films, Batman films, and I've just been, you know, I've begun to watch uh, one new series that's on. And I've been thinking a bit about the way in which all superhero stories wrestle with identity. They all wrestle and struggle, don't they, with like, do I keep my identity hidden? What's my true identity? And how does that look in the world? There's, a, there's an eternal fascination, actually, I think, with stories about our identity in our culture, about the stories that drive them. As a family, we watched a, a set of Batman films recently, and there's a set of stories, a set of events, a set of beliefs that drive Bruce Wayne, Batman, into his behaviors. But the gospel says that our identity is received, not achieved. We don't earn it by the things that we perform. That's a message I keep coming back to myself. Because I'm fundamentally a person who, in my fallenness and my brokenness, I believe that I'm only as lovable as my last success. That's the lie that still grabs hold of my heart and makes me feel depressed and desperate and miserable. I love to get things done. I love to achieve things. I love to be successful. I love to build things. But at worst, I do so because I think it will make me worthy of love. But Jesus has taught me a better way. He says, you are loved. Jesus has given to me the identity I truly need. Where I'd lost my identity as a child of God, Jesus has given it to me. I've been saved. I know a better story about who I am. Andrew prayed earlier on for us, the collect for the second Sunday of Epiphany. She says this, Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace and in the renewal of our lives make known your heavenly glory. Our identity, our vocation is to be image bearers, to, to, to represent Christ in the world, to bear God's image for all of creation. We are made to reflect and to reveal his likeness in the world. And when we live in that story, when we look to the cross, to the death and resurrection of Jesus as the activating event which has enabled us to be reconciled to God, when, when we believe that story, when we live it out, then God's kingdom will be made manifest in our midst. I want to invite you where you are just to stand if you're able to and to pray. I'd like to pray for us all. And I sense that for one or two people watching online at the moment, you are struggling with this sense of identity. That there is pain and, and heartache. Perhaps you feel as though you have been 
driven to choose an identity for yourself that doesn't quite fit or you're wrestling with how your sense of self relates to other people. You might just want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak those words of life and love into your heart again today. You are my daughter, my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And I'm going to pray that collect again, but I'm going to make it personal. And the words aren't going to come up on the screen, but I'm going to pause after each line. And I want to invite you, wherever you are, just out loud to repeat my words back. This is going to be our act again of dedication and and an invitation for the truth of God's story to be made real in our lives again. So wherever you are, just repeat after me. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of my nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of my life. Make known your heavenly glory. Amen. I'd like to invite you just to remain in an attitude of prayer as Nick leads our intercessions. Heavenly Father, thank you for the unconditional love that you give us. No matter who we are or what we have done, we are thankful that you reconcile us to you. Help us to encourage your Holy Spirit in our lives that we may be transformed and be made new again through your grace and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray 